Surgery is becoming more and more advanced every single day, but there are still some things we haven't quite mastered in the medical world. While things like liver and kidney transplants are almost second nature for surgeons, we're still waiting to find out what would happen if you undertook a full head transplant. From the physical to the psychological after effects, we're here today to talk you through whether or not you'd make it through the surgery. The Hub is here to answer all your burning questions. So before we start, make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss out on the rest of our great videos. When we think of the possibilities of what we could achieve if we could successfully complete a head transplant, we almost get lost in the vast potential. People who are paralyzed or have degenerative limbs or other whole body ailments could be fixed with a single operation. Long term, it can mean that people with enough money could successfully keep themselves alive for huge periods of time, simply by getting rid of their aging body and placing their head on a new, young body. Now, if that doesn't give you shivers, then we're not sure what will. We'd also like to figure out how to keep an aging head and brain in good condition, but that's a video for another time. Either way, it's never been successfully done yet. In 2015, scientist Sergio Canavero claimed that he would be the first to complete a head transplant. The act of removing a head from the otherwise not working body and reattaching it onto a working body. He said he'd be able to complete it by 2017, but science has still not yet progressed enough for us to achieve this great feat, as we're sure you can imagine. Putting someone's head onto a different body requires more than a few rounds of sticky tape and a handful of stitches. In fact, it's even more complex than a transplant of any other type because it includes muscles, skin, ligaments, bones, blood vessels, and most importantly, the nerves of the spinal cord. But when you consider just how easily we can now transplant various other body parts, you might wonder what other reasons there are as to why the head transplant is just so much more difficult. Sure, Canavero had a bit of experience putting together various heads and bodies with varying amounts of success. An 18 hour surgery in China seemed to be enough to convince him he was onto something special. But there was a slight caveat. The surgery he completed was on two dead patients. It was great progress in the sense that he could see exactly what needed to go where and how long he would hypothetically have to complete the process. But it wasn't a true, real life example of a head transplant. French surgeon Alexis Carrel was the actual first person to attempt a head transplant in 1908. He worked with Charles Laud Guthrie, an American surgeon, to graft the head of one dog onto another, which looked like a success, but only for a few minutes. The dog could show some reflexes, but was killed shortly after for ethical purposes. Carrel's work, although unsuccessful, earned him a Nobel Prize, while Guthrie was most likely excluded because of the controversial and unethical elements of the research. Some further studies were attempted on monkeys and seemed to show success, but they were also killed before any long-term progress could be noted. The first ever successful transplant wasn't until 1954, when Dr. Joseph Murray and Dr. David Hume transplanted a kidney from one identical twin to the other. Since then, we've progressed to transplanting other organs and body parts fairly easily, and they didn't even take that long either. In 2011, Linda Liu became the first person to receive a hand transplant and a follow-up operation on a different patient the same year only took 11 and a half hours to complete a double hand transplant. And while you might be able to survive a body part transplant, it's a whole other story when it comes to your head. And there's a handful of reasons why. For a start, connecting a new hand onto an arm requires a lot of effort and stitching different elements together, but we're not quite talking thousands of pieces. Once the bones, muscles, and joints are all together, the nerve endings can be attached and special medication is given to the patient to ensure their body doesn't reject the new hand. On larger body parts, the surgery is obviously more intricate, but nothing compares to the thousands and thousands of nerve endings that connect the spinal cord to the brain. To fully understand this, we need to briefly touch on paralysis. Now, a common reason why paralysis happens is when the brain stem, the area that connects the brain to the spinal cord, becomes damaged. The reason why paralysis is a permanent issue is because so far, no one has figured out how to reattach the two broken components successfully. Not only are there many nerves within the spinal cord, but they also vary in type. There are also eight pairs of cervical nerves, 12 pairs of thoracic nerves, five pairs of lumbar nerves, five pairs of sacral nerves, and one pair of coccygeal nerves, but it doesn't end there. Within each of these nerve endings are sensory fibers, and each individual one splits into two. When you look at all the different connections, there are millions in total. Figuring out how to successfully reconnect each one of these to where they started before the transplant is something that no scientist has ever truly figured out quite yet. Another problem with completing the head transplant is the difficulty with finishing or even starting the surgery without cutting off the blood supply to the brain. For example, most types of brain damage are thought to have happened due to the lack of blood to the brain.
brain. Many people who are born with brain damage or develop it during the first hours of their lives end up this way because the blood supply has been cut off of the brain during birth, which then cuts off any oxygen. And it doesn't take long for this to happen, because in the space of less than a minute, the brain will start shutting down. Hold off the blood for any longer and you'll find yourself with a brain dead patient. So if we're removing somebody's head with the intention of putting it on a different body, we need to figure out how to best continue the blood supply while we do so. If the body and brain were both cooled before the surgery, then it would buy us some more time, but only around an hour in total. Certainly not enough time to complete the whole operation at the rate that we're used to at the moment. And it's not just the brain that requires a constant supply of blood. The body's nervous system controls essential functions like the heart beating and allowing us to breathe, both actions that we don't consciously do because our bodies do them without us thinking about it. This only happens because our brains tell our bodies to continue these motions. So if you're separating each component, then you'll understand that there's a big problem going on with continuing these functions while we pull them apart from each other. One last major physical problem with this surgery is the issue of neuropathic pain. Pain caused from damaging the nervous system. It might be one thing to successfully connect each nerve path back to a new source, but what happens if the nerves are connected wrong? With millions inside each body, it's almost certain that at least a few could become incorrectly attached, and who knows what kinds of pain that would result in. The symptoms from neuropathic pain can vary, from pins and needles to numbness and itching, but can also be as severe as stabbing pains or electric shock type symptoms. Admittedly, there's not much point looking into tackling the after effects of a successful head transplant if we haven't even figured out the first logistics. If we don't know how to connect the nerve endings yet, what's the point of looking into what happens once they're connected? But neuropathic pain is already experienced by the percentage of the world's population. So it's strange that not much more research has looked into it. When it comes to other types of transplant, the symptoms often hidden or ignored, but it would be impossible to hide them on the same scale as a head transplant. But this isn't to say we haven't tried out any research of this kind, because the first successful face transplant happened only recently in 2015, and has so far had no problems. So, scientists know how to operate on the superficial levels of head-based transplants, but we're still getting the grips with all the internal elements. So pretend that we've come this far. Scientists have found a body for your head to sit on. They've somehow managed to reconnect all of your nerve endings as well, as the bones, tissues, and fibers that also needed to be reattached. And you've woken up with a new body. What happens next? Like a lot of transplants, the problems are only just beginning here. From a few simple stitches to an entire new limb, the human body is good at guessing what belongs to it and what shouldn't be there. You might find if you get a new ear piercing that your skin seems to slowly push it to the surface. Similarly, if you've recently had stitches, you can find the skin around becomes very red and angry. On a larger scale, people who have had limbs transplanted can find their body begins to reject the new limb after realizing that it hasn't always been there. Scientists are used to seeing this and try and counteract the intelligence of our bodies by giving us medication that prevents rejection. Most of the time, it works, but on occasion, the piercing or body part has to be removed and surgeons can try again in a later date. Not everyone reacts to intrusions of this sort in the same manner, but it's the reason why people who have an internal transplant, like a heart or liver, are kept in the hospital for a while after to check that their body agrees with it. But now let's look at this on a larger scale. A head transplant. It's one thing for the body to reject a small piercing or even a limb, but what happens when the body rejects a whole head? Because it's an operation that's never been successfully completed, no one can truly begin to guess just what it feels like to have an entire body reject a human head. And we're pretty glad to be left in the dark with this one. But it's another thing surgeons have to consider when talking about the possibilities of a whole head transplant. It's not like you can give a quick dose of medication and hope for the best because the brain or body might be responding entirely differently to each other anyways. Even if you made it through this part of the operation and you woke up, clear from rejection with a fully functioning body attached to your head, there's one last thing that'll put everything you've read about ethics right in the forefront of your mind. Many patients who experience an external transplant like a body part seem to suffer a lot of psychological trauma afterwards. Sure, it'd be one thing to wake up and find you've had a body part amputated, but how do you think you'd feel to wake up and find you've got someone else's leg attached to your body all of a sudden? You wouldn't be able to stop yourself from comparing the two. Now think of this problem on a larger scale and imagine waking up from your head transplant and looking down on an entirely new body. Chances are you wouldn't recognize it and wouldn't be able to innately know it inside out like your own body. Because unsurprisingly, there aren't that many bodies around that would be an exact match for a head transplant. Finding someone ideal, like a person of the same gender who died of a head injury with no trauma to the body would be hard to come by. More likely, you'd end up finding your head put on someone of a different height or weight, possibly with differing features from your own. 
After the surgery, you can wake up and find yourself entirely paralyzed, with no movement from any of your body at all. And the worst part, because of the issue of no communication between the brain and body, you might not even be aware of it. Although, in the future, you might survive a head transplant. There's no way of knowing just how it could end up. Now that you're aware of the odds, would you attempt a head transplant? Let us know in the comments. We hope you enjoyed this video, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.